I'm a dying breed. I'm a dying breed. I'm a dying breed. Let him hear the artillery. Hi, Pat. How are you doing? Nice to speak to you, sir. Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, congratulations on the uh, the movie. It's fantastic. I was just watching it again last night. Um, it's a really great movie. Uh, what I was kind of looking into what you'd done previously. What I felt was very curious is the fact that you, the I mean the first film that you did I think it was based on a a, a real life gangster, no? And then the next film was a horror yeah, movie, yeah. but at the same time that was also based on a real life story, no? And then this one I, yeah, I, again, yeah. obviously this is historical, but it's also based on real life, yeah, no? A, yeah. a character. What is it? Is is there, is there something uh, in your criteria that you kind of you prefer to keep one foot in reality when when? kind of coming up with a film is that something out of your own self preference or, or is that just has that just been by by chance yeah i mean it's actually you know I, I love you know true stories or based on true stories because i think life can write something you know which is pretty incredible and uh, you know if you just create it as a filmmaker uh, it might not be as good as you know if it's created by by the real life so I, I usually use the the true stories and I, I find and dig everything about them. And then I use the pieces, but I usually create a story, you know, which is which tells a lot about the, the period, about the person, but which is created for the for the movie, you know, to make it work and to show everything what I want to show and make, you know, just like uh here with the medieval it was uh, i wanted to show how beautiful is our country uh, how many beautiful castles we have uh, how is the how was the nature there show prague and charles bridge uh, from medieval times and uh, i also wanted to show his personal story because that was very important for me uh, to uh, to show how he changed from paid mercenary to, you know, somebody who was paid to kill people, to somebody who was fighting for uh, what he believed in, you know, for justice, for freedom. And uh, yeah, so that was that was something what I wanted to get into the movie, and also uh, the uh, Catherine's character uh, being next to Jan Zizka and uh, to have a big influence on him. Uh, which is, you know, very often in our lives that uh, women have, you know, a big influence on on us. So mm -hmm. I wanted to have it there. Uh -huh. And was it was it all, always your uh, intention from from the get go, from from the very beginning, for this to be an English language film to kind of share this this Czech history with the whole world, rather than doing it in your own country? Yeah, uh, actually, well, we were planning to do it in Czech in the beginning, but right. uh, then the the uh, basically the budget was very high. It was like uh, four million dollars, which you cannot get back here in the Czech Republic from the Czech market. So right. then I decided to make the budget much higher, but with in English speaking, you know, with English speaking film, you can you can get it back, you know, from all the territories. Right. So it can go out. And actually the reason why, you know, actually the main reason was that I wanted uh, all the people in the world to watch it, to to have that, you know, just like uh, in English, it's it's much probable that it's gonna, uh, that somebody will watch it. So I wanted to show this, this story to everybody. And yeah, that was, a, you know, very important reason why I chose uh, English. Mm -hmm. Obviously, one thing is to, to film it in English, but then obviously you've got this next obstacle, which is to get actors, hopefully renowned actors, no, um, to 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 kind of do this for you. And you, I mean, I was when I was reading the story about how you got the cast together. I remembered um, when Sylvester Stallone wrote Rocky, he would not make it unless he was the star. And I think you were kind of very much in this. You were very much in this same vein, no, in that you wanted. Uh, ben for your lead and then even though people were saying there's no way you're going to get Sir Michael Caine on board and you wouldn't have any of it and you just went straight ahead and, and, you, and you, I think you were the first person that one of your producers said that you had managed to get him onto a film no? Yeah absolutely I mean I uh, I had my dreams 
Of course, un I underestimated how difficult it is to get stars on board. You know, I, I didn't know it before because I did uh, movies without, you know, huge American or British stars. So uh, my, uh, you know, I produced this movie together with Cassian Elvis. Uh, he has done, you know, over 100 movies. And he told me that it's impossible to get Michael Caine. So he has he he it was his dream to do a movie with Michael Caine. So I said, no, no, we I have to try it and we have to do it. If he says no, I'll be fine. But he said yes, and then Cassian sent me a picture of himself, you know, being 13 years old and Michael Caine next to him on a picture, and he wrote me, it's unbelievable because it took me 50 years to make my dream come through. And I never believed, you know, I would never believe that it would happen with you, a boy from uh, Eastern Europe. <laughs> and it, 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 was, it was really pretty amazing. That's fantastic. Uh, feeling. I'm, I'm curious, what was it about Michael King? Because I believe that you, you sent him the, uh, the script and, the, and he, I think he phoned you up personally, no? What, did, what, was it, what were his first comments? When it, what, what did he tell you about the, the script that made him decide that this was, this was something that he wanted to do? And I mean, he was, he's in his late 80s now, so it's, he must be very choosy yeah. as well, even more so than before, no, about what he does. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I wrote him a, a personal email, I mean, a letter about why I chose him and why he's the best for the part, you know, and, and uh, who is Jan Zizka, because, of course, you know, um, not many people uh, know who, who, who he was. So, and then suddenly I was at my cottage and, and uh, uh, my cell phone was ringing and I, answered, I, I saw unknown number and I, and I answered it and there was like, hello, this is Michael Caine here. And I was like, <laughs> what? Oh my God. And then he says, you've got lovely screenplay and I'm very looking forward to to working with you uh, and we'll see each other soon. And and I, I was not able to, to say anything. I was just like, it was unbelievable, unbelie unbelievable feeling. I, I still remember that. And then I went down and I told my my family what happened and we were yelling like, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it felt absolutely unbelievable. And uh, yeah, and I, I I still remember that feeling. And when we got when he got to Prague, uh, I talked to him about everything about the shooting. And of course, I was thinking, how can I direct Michael Caine? It just you, you like what what can I do? And he said, no, no, just like whatever, just whatever you want, I'm gonna do it. And I always told him what I wanted. And then he came back and said, do you want to change something? And I said, yeah, maybe you could change this and that. And he did it. So he never asked me questions because he, he said, Peter, I chose you and I 100% trust you. So you explained me why you want to do it before. So now you just tell me what I'm doing wrong or what you want differently and I'll do it. And that was so incredible. And that he's great professional also and a super humble man. And yeah. I, I love them both with his wife. And I also produced another movie right after the Medieval, which was bestsellers with Aubrey Plaza, uh, and we shot it in Canada. So, and we did it together with Cassian Elvis because we love Michael Caine, and we we didn't wanna, we just wanted to produce one more movie with him. So we did. Yeah, that was oh, fantastic. Incredible. What a great story. Yeah. Uh -huh. Brilliant. And then I want to talk a little about your background, obviously, because you you I mean, I was reading you were an Olympic judoku. Back in the back in the day, no, and then you went on to do to work to do yeah, stunt yeah, work. Yeah. I'm curious, yeah, yeah. the three films that you filmed, you've written them yourselves, you've directed them yourselves. I'm curious, from having this background, how do you approach writing a film? Do you come up with the story first and then fill it in with the action that you wanted, or the other way around, and then see kind of where the action can take uh, a story somewhere else? Which comes first, the action or the story? I imagine the story first, no. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The story has to be first, but sometimes when I get some material, I see some pieces of action. So I write them down. If I, if I, you know, just like want to do something special uh, with uh, in medieval, it was the the mace he he was using, uh, which is very you know dangerous weapon. It was only the weapon 
in medieval time uh, when uh, you could uh, smash a helmet, uh, you can, you mm -hmm. could just uh, break uh, armor. That was so heavy and uh, yeah. so you know brutal that you could you could just kill somebody uh, with one hit. So uh, I I'm, then I was planning just little pieces. Uh, which I liked uh, and I wanted to have in the movie, but I always have to have the story first because then you even find out maybe this can be used even if, if it's great, but it takes place somewhere, but you know, we cannot get into the story. So I'm always trying to find the best story and then add the action because action is just, you know, the spicy of the story, but it, it's mm -hmm. the core has to be the story. Uh huh. And when it comes to the actual action scenes, um, how much of that is actually on the script, and how much of that is kind of innovated or choreographed on the day? I mean, I imagine you've got most of it down in the script, but then when you once you actually get to the actual set pieces, because some of them are pretty large scale, extensive set pieces, how much of that is actually kind of worked on the day, and how far? I mean, obviously this this film gets pretty violent, pretty gory. Did you set yourself any kind of limits or because of the time it was set in, did you kind of let that bar kind of break that barrier and just kind of let it go where it went? Yeah, I mean, uh, it was pretty well prepared, you know, and we had we had this core team of stuntmen like a month before the shooting and they were training and we were, uh, you know, preparing choreography for all those fights. I was fighting with them, trying to find the best uh, movement for all the characters, what should be happening in those scenes. And then, and we were filming it with stun guys and doubles for those actors. And then we showed it to the actors. They were training, uh, you know, what we planned, what we prepared for them. And they were also changing pieces because sometimes actors are not able to do the same stuff okay. as stuntmen. So we had to change it a, a little bit and then we got to the location and something changed. For example, it was wet and yeah. uh, because it was raining the whole, whole, whole night. And suddenly you couldn't, uh, you know, jump from a stone to another stone. So you had to change it. So it was like 80 per or it was snowing actually one day. And I was like, oh my God, how can we have uh, snow, you know, in our movie? Uh, so we had to wait you know, and, and do stuff differently. But 80% uh, was prepared and 20% uh, they, they were changed. You know, it was changed uh, on the set. Mm -hmm. And what about the kind of the, 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 this, the limit, the barrier that you set yourself? Because obviously I know that you, you were inspired a lot by Braveheart, which the violence and the kind of the, the go we see there doesn't hold back, nor does yours. Was, did you set yourself a limit at all? Because some people... Often when a, a film gets very violent, they, they kind of say that it could be gratuitous, no? And, and, and just for the sake of it. But did you ever kind of set yourself a limit? Was that something that was always in the back of your mind when you were filming those scenes? Yeah, I, I, I knew that uh, we need a soft version for TV. So we've got like 12 plus version right. where I just like, I was always planning to do all the shots, which, which are brutal. Uh, I, I shot them over somebody's face, so somebody's reaction. So I knew that I can, I can. Uh, it could be uh, like uh, uh, we can cut around it and make it softer, or keep the br brutality there. So I thought like medieval times were brutal, and because I wanted to be very realistic and make, you know, I wanted the the movie to feel real. I, I couldn't just skip those moments. Yeah. I felt like we have to show something. And uh, of course, sometimes people tell me, uh, like, you know, with the version 15 plus, that some some women are not watching all the time, all these scenes, which is fine. And, uh, but they, they, they still say that they can uh, follow the, the main story. You know, which is you know a love story kind of, and you know even if it's the uh, it's different, but uh, yeah, I, I think this is the part of it. Like, I wanted to show how beautiful the medieval world was, but also how brutal and ugly it was, and this combination, this contrast, uh, actually makes it more believable. I think. 
Definitely, definitely, yeah. Well, listen, we're, we're going to wrap. It's been really good to speak to you, Peter. I wish you the best of luck with the film when it comes out next week. And I hope to speak to you uh, again about another uh, film sometime soon. Okay, thanks a lot. It was great to speaking to you and, and uh, have a good, good luck with this show. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Cheers. All the very best. Are you insane? <laughs>